<laughs> Welcome everybody. Good morning um, from Sky Islands. And um, we're so glad you can join us today for our Southwest Wings 30th anniversary. And it's a special virtual uh, speaker series we've set up for you. I'm Mary Sia. And I'm Chris Harbour. And we're really glad you can join us. We just wanted to uh, go over a couple housekeeping things. Lots of you already know this, but just a friendly reminder that um, if you have question and, and questions, uh, Jillian's going to answer them at the end of her presentation. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. Try to avoid putting them in the chat box because they can really get buried in there and we might miss them. Yep, we're very pleased to welcome Gillian Cowles back. She wowed us last time with her images of arachnids. And today she's going to talk to us um, about um, partnerships between plants and insects and tell us some tantalizing tales of treachery. So over to you, Gillian. All right, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, so this talk is titled Partnerships and Betrayal, Plant and Insect Interactions. So we'll go through a couple of really boring slides first, really fast. Um, so plant-insect interactions can consist of herbivory and defenses against herbivory, pollination that involves co-evolution of plants and pollinators, and then special relationships tend to fall in the ant-plant relationships. So in herbivory, you can have chewing, type herbivores that we're all familiar with, such as grasshoppers, walking sticks, beetles, caterpillars, and wood borers and root borers. And then you can also have piercing sucking insects, such as true bugs, cicadas, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, scales, and aphids. And then you have a couple of sort of special categories, uh, galls, such as gall midges and gall wasps, miners, such as beetles, moths, and sawflies, and under plant defenses, you can have direct defenses that include chemical defenses and hypersensitivity reactions and indirect defenses that involve calling in predators, parasitoids, and enlisting a community response. So we'll start with a few of the herbivores. So all of these insects were photographed right in southern Arizona and we're really lucky that southern Arizona has some spectacular insects that look very tropical and a toothpick grasshopper that's pink and a panther grasshopper and uh, then among other of the orthopterans that we might not be thinking about immediately would be things like tree crickets um, Walking sticks are some of the other herbivores that you might see. And these longhorned walking sticks that have these long antenna, like the creosote walking stick you might see in bushes. And then these little short horned walking sticks with short antennas that look so much like grasses. You might see those actually in grasses. And then of course, leaf beetles are a major part of the uh, herbivory picture. And the chrysomelid beetles are among the most specialized of the leaf beetles. Many of these chrysomelid beetles have evolved the ability to sequester or uh, metabolize toxins that plants um, produce in defense against herbivory. And when they sequester the toxins, they can actually deploy those toxins for the, the uh, beetle's own defense. So here's a chrysomelid beetle larva on a convolvulucid plant. And that's what this one would look like when it's adult. It's a beautiful gold and black tortoise beetle. Caterpillars, of course, are more or less eating machines. And you have some very generalist caterpillars that will eat almost anything like this white lion sphinx moth caterpillar. And then you have highly specialized uh, moths that not only have to lay their egg on a particular species of plant. For example, this shinia has to lay its eggs on desert broom plant. And not only that, but it has to lay its eggs where two different sexes of desert broom plant, a male and a female plant, are in close proximity because its larva actually requires 
feeding from both a male plant and a female plant in order to mature properly. And then you have some specialized types of herbiv herbivory from some caterpillars, for example, Synclora caterpillars, which grow up into these lovely little green moths, they do something really special. They not only feed on plants, but they'll tie part of the plant on their back with silk. So in this case, this um, Bahia absinthifolia plant, it's actually snipped off little florets and tied these little florets onto its back as part of its uh, camouflage. And then let's not forget things like wood borer beetles, such as this buprestrid beetle, and uh, root borer beetles, such as the Palaverde root borers. Among the piercing sucking insects are true bugs, such as this milkweed bug. And of course, one of the really spectacular bugs in our area are the giant mesquite bugs. And these get everybody very excited when they see these things flying around. They look almost impossibly large. They look very tropical. And even their little nymphs are kind of colorful. As their nymphs grow up, they look very conspicuous and they'll tend to band together in these aggregations and they'll have these bright warning colors. And one reason why they can be so conspicuous is that they have glands on their dorsal surface. These two structures here are glands that release uh, very pungent chemicals that deter most predators. But there are a few predators that actually love to eat these things, including pallid bats. And pallid bats will land on mesquite trees and walk along the branches and gather up these uh, giant mesquite bug nymphs and, and carry them back to their roost and munch on them. So also among the piercing and sucking bugs are cicadas. And of course, their nymphs spend many years underground feeding on roots and leaf hoppers. So leaf hoppers come in a lot of different beautiful, spectacular colors here in Arizona. We have some very, very pretty leaf hoppers. To me, purple is just something you don't expect to see in an insect. And these beautiful little metallic golden green ones, some of them look quite fanciful. And the membracid plant hoppers are really cool. Now, most people think that only in the tropics do you find really fanciful looking membracids, but here's the eye on this bug. And you can see it's got this huge structure up above its eye, which makes it look like a thorn. And some of these membracid uh, nymphs can be very fanciful looking. And of course, these are all piercing sucking bugs. This is an oak tree hopper really beautiful animals. And this is one of my favorites that's found on cat claw acacia. These, this little membracid, you can see its little eyes down here, it has sort of a grumpy cat look, but it's got these two spines coming out of its head that mimic the thorns on, a, on an acacia. And some of the uh, plant hoppers, like Ecleus, is sort of interesting. The nymphs of these live actually underground instead of being up on the leaves. And so one of the things about piercing sucking insects is that they're sucking down juices of plants. And as a consequence, they're taking in far more carbohydrate than protein. So the limiting nutrient is actually protein. And of course, for a young nymph, it needs protein in order to grow. So it takes in a, a great excess of carbohydrate, of sugars. And in aphids, you'll see that uh, excreted as honeydew, but in these succeed nymphs that live underground and feed on tree roots, th what they do is they produce these waxy filaments out of their rear end, out of that excess carbohydrate. That way they're not gumming up the surface with honeydew. And they also have this built-in distraction for any predator that might go for this waxy tail, which, which can easily be dropped. So some of the other uh, plant hopper nymphs that live up on trees also produce these waxy filaments as nymphs. Here's one that lives on oaks. 
that the adult was seen in this slide here, but the nymph produces a little waxy filament that looks like a little pink tail, which it, it erects and spreads if it, if it feels threatened. So a predator would hopefully go after that little pink tail rather than after the little nymph. And another kind of piercing sucking insect are lac scales. So in Sabino Canyon, you can see these Corsetia plants. And if you look on the stems, you'll notice that the stems have this odd blobs of resin on the outside. And you'll also see, if you look closely, these little red things are actually the scale insects. And these are lac scale insects. So shellac is actually produced by collecting resin from scale insects and then processing it into shellac. And the, the word lac uh, derives from a Sanskrit word that means 100,000. So it's kind of uh, in reference to the fact that these things are in great numbers on the, the uh, tree branches. So among the gall formers, of course, galls can be formed by, by viruses, fungi, mites, or insects. And I'm just going to be going over a couple of the major groups of insects that form galls. One of them is gall midges, and here's a pair of little gall midges. And one of the most conspicuous kinds of galls that you see in the southwestern deserts are on salt bushes. So these fuzzy structures are actually from those little gall midges that I showed. And another gall that you frequently see in the low desert are on creosote bushes. So this is a creosote gall, also formed by gall midges. Now the real masters of gall formation among the insect world are cynipid wasps, though. So cynipid wasps are tiny little wasps. They're only about three millimeters long, very nondescript looking, but they form these spectacular array of different galls. Each cynipid wasp species forms its own galls. So here's some spectacular ones from on oak trees formed by cynipid wasps. And you can have fuzzy ones and urn-shaped galls. This is just a close-up of that urn-shaped gall. And even spindle-shaped galls. So those were all from oak trees in southern Arizona. And another group of herbivores that you tend to overlook are leaf miners. So this is an adult beetle, chrysomelid beetle, whose larva actually tunnels within the tissues of the leaf and it feeds within the tissues of the leaf. So you can actually see some of these tunnels on the leaf that this adult is sitting on. And some of the other leaf miners may be weevils, like this particular kind of weevil, and moths. So microlep moths, and when I say microlep, I mean really microlep. These things are only about three millimeters long when they emerge. But there's many, many, many species of leaf miner moths. And you can see what this leaf looks like, this oak leaf, that the miner were, was uh, feeding within the tissues of the leaf. But sometimes what you get emerging from that leaf is a little wasp instead of the leaf miner. So in this particular case, a parasitoid wasp found the little larval leaf miner and it actually killed and uh, used that leaf miner as its host for its own development. So this brings us to the idea of what do plants do in defense of herbivory? Well, one of the first defenses is producing chemical defenses, alkaloids, that can be incorporated in the leaves of the plant that will either be toxic or at least uh, negatively affect the growth of the herbivore. However, as you can see in this datura leaf, this chrysomelid beetle has clearly developed a method of either sequestering those alkaloids on this datura leaf or metabolizing those alkaloids. And as I mentioned earlier, some uh, chrysomelid beetles can actually incorporate the sequestered alkaloids for their own defenses. 
against being predated against. So you can see all the holes chewed in this leaf. Obviously, these beetles are able to feed on this leaf just fine. For in defense against galls, if a plant discovers a gall in the early stages of its growth, the plant can uh, deploy a hypersensitivity reaction in which it walls off that section of the leaf and actually kills the cells and starves out the gall. So that's actually called the hypersensitivity reaction of a plant. Now alkaloids or other chemical defenses like tannins um, are direct defenses. But in addition, plants can do an indirect defense. So for example, this is a specific example of where a defect, uh, indirect defense was deployed against aphids. So these aphids were on a cilantro plant that was in my greenhouse. And being in the greenhouse, uh, predators and parasitoids had trouble discovering this plant that was infested with aphids. So I put the plant outside and within hours, surfid flies started to appear. And lo and behold, what these surfid flies were doing, you can see this white object at the very tip of the abdomen. And there it is. The surfid fly had just laid an egg right between these aphids. And what hatches out of these surfid fly eggs are surfid fly larvae, which are maggots. But these particular maggots live on leaves. And what they love to do is eat aphids. So here's a surfid fly. This is its head, and it's actually slurping down an aphid. And here's another one. So the cilantro produced volatile chemicals, which signaled to the surfid flies that there were aphids on that plant. And the surfid flies detected those volatile chemicals and laid their eggs on the plant. Now, another uh, animal that was drawn in were, was a kind of a parasitoid. So this is a kind of little wasp that goes after aphids. So here's another one that's on and going after some aphids. Whoops, let me go back. That's actually ovipositing in an aphid. And then after they're done ovipositing, they clean their little ovipositors. And then back to the cilantro that was uh, infested with aphids. This is an aphid in which the wasp larva is still developing. And you can see in, through this clear aphid, this larva right inside, and different stages of, uh, of uh, parasitized aphids here on the cilantro leaf. This one here is part, you know, part way to becoming what I call a little pinata. These ones all look like little pinatas at this point. And these ones have wasps that are pupating inside the aphid. And then here's little hatches that the wasps cut when they're ready to emerge as adult wasps. So the interesting thing about indirect defenses is that the plant is able to detect by way of the saliva of the herbivore the plant then knows what kind of volatiles to release to call in the correct predators and parasitoids. So this is all fine-tuned by the plant in response specifically to the herbivores that are feeding on that plant. So it's really, really an exquisite case of co-evolution between the plant and its uh, the parasitoids and predators that will help go after the herbivores. So let's talk a little bit about plants and pollinators now. So plants evolve nectar, pollen, flower form, and blooming time in response to pollinators. And pollinators evolve structures such as tongues, eyesight, etc., and behaviors that include flower handling, covering, fidelity to a certain kind of plant, etc in response to flowers. So plants and their pollinators have co-evolved, contributing to the explosion in angiosperm diversity. Angiosperms are the flowering plants. So types of pollinators include bats, birds, in including doves and hummingbirds, and insects, which are beetles, flies, butterflies, moths, wasps, and bees. So a plant like an agave is up on a very tall stalk, 
And these generally attract things like bats at night. So bats are probably the principal pollinators of agaves. Saguaros also draw bats at night, but in addition, they're probably also pollinated by birds like doves during the day. So the um, nectar of saguaros is extremely dilute and there are very few native bees that can actually utilize the nectar because it's so dilute. But things like nectar feeding bats can utilize it just fine. So this is a case where the type of nectar is very strongly uh, co-evolved with the actual pollinator that visits the plant. Some plants like erythrina have these tubular, very uh, skinny tubular shaped flowers which are clearly bird pollinated, specifically by hummingbirds. So those long tubular uh, flowers are evolved in response to an animal that can hover and has a long tongue. Same with these penstemon eatoni. If you look at these, these are downward pointing, they have no landing platform, and so consequently, they're really evolved for a hovering animal like a hummingbird. Con if you contrast these penstemon eatoni with this penstemon discolor, you'll see a marked contrast. These penstemon discolor have a landing platform for an insect to land on, plus it's got nectar guides to guide the insect into the throat of the plant. And then it even has these little fake anthers sticking up. The real anthers are up here but the fake anthers are there as an additional lure for insects. So hopefully an insect will go right into the throat, get a nice little nectar reward, and also collect some pollen. So some plants have extremely complicated flowers that require a significant amount of learning on the part of the pollinator in order to handle the flower. So for example, these delphiniums have a spur at the back where the nectar is located, and the, the pollinator actually has to navigate a fairly complicated flower in order to get a reward. Uh, monk's hoods are considered one of the most complicated flowers and they're closely related to these delphiniums. They're both in the buttercup family. And another group of plants that have complicated flower handling are the peas and beans and clover and alfalfa. So this is a, a clover cluster of flowers and you'll notice that they have sort of a keel shape. This is the keel here, right in the middle. And the anthers are hidden within that structure. And the pollinator actually has to put pressure on that keel in order to free up the anthers. So pollinators have to learn how to pollinate these clover in order to get access to the, the uh, anthers. And the honeybees actually make terrible pollinators for things like clover and alfalfa. The bees that are really good at it are these alkali bees in the genus Nomia. So here's an alkali bee actually visiting a wild bean flower. You can see the little bean in the background that's forming. So this phaseolus flower is being handled by this experienced Nomia bee and the bee in consequence is able to pollinate this flower but a honeybee would probably fail to pollinate this flower because it could, doesn't know how to do the correct flower handling. Another kind of plant that requires special handling are in the nightshade family. So this is a silver leaf nightshade and tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, those are all in the Solanaceae family, same, same family. So if you look closely at these anthers, they're sort of shaped like a little pouch almost. And at the tip of the anther are these pores. And what the pollinator has to do is grasp the anther with its mandibles, and then it vibrates its wing muscles very rapidly. And the pollen starts bouncing around inside the anther and all of a sudden comes exploding out of the pores at the tip of the anther. And if you ever want to check this for yourself, if you grow tomatoes, you can use an electric toothbrush. Just take the little toothbrush off of the end and use the little um, electric toothbrush structure itself and just run it at the base of those anthers and you'll see a little explosion of pollen come out very quickly. 
it takes less than a second of these uh, vibration to get the pollen to come out. And this is called buzz pollination. Now the plants that are crop plants that require buzz pollination are in the Ericaceae family that include blueberries and strawberries. And also our manzanita are in this family. So among the buzz pollinating uh, insects are bumblebees and mason bees. So here's a mason bee visiting a manzanita flower and it's actually reaching in there and doing its buzz pollination. So orchard bees that include these mason bees are used for pollinating specialized crops such as uh, cranberries and blueberries. They actually are not pollinated at all by honeybees and Bees like bumblebees are used in commercial uh, tomato greenhouses to do the pollination there because honeybees can't do that job either. Now plants have another way of signaling to their pollinators. You'll notice that this Mexican Palo Verde tree has uh, more than one color of banner petal there. And on close inspection, you'll see that some of the banner petals are this deep sort of orangey color and others are yellow with orange freckles. So the banner petal of these leguminous plants changes color in response to having been pollinated. So this orange color signifies that that flower had already been pollinated and the yellow flower signifies that it needs to receive pollination. This makes it much more efficient for the plant and the pollinator to get the job done. So the, this lupin all these flowers opened at the same time, but you'll notice that some of the flowers have a deep purpley color banner petal and the other ones have a white banner petal. And in addition, you'll notice that these deep purpley ones, some of them even show the little anthers being exposed from the keel shape where they've been freed. And that signifies, that deep purple color signifies that this flower has already been pollinated. And so it tells the pollinator to go to a different flower. And this makes everything much more efficient for everybody. Now, some flowers have evolved uh, special structures in response to their pollinators. For example, this Mirabilis longiflora is pollinated at night. And you can see from the long, long corolla on this flower that it requires a pollinator that has a very long tongue. And blooming at night and with a long tongue, that sort of narrows it down. It's probably a sphinx moth that is the pollinator for this plant. But this shows a very nice example, a co-evolution where the plant has evolved a longer and longer corolla in response to the longer and longer tongues of the moths. And that way the moth has to get its little face right in with these anthers. If it can reach the nectar reward without touching the anthers, it's not performing a pollination duty. So for example, this white line sphinx moth is not pollinating this thistle flower. It's able to reach the nectar reward with that very long tongue. However, if it was visiting that Mirabilis, that flower, then it would probably do the pollination job just fine. Now, some pollinators are more or less considered generalists, and that includes beetles and flies. And then some are more specialized. Uh, now, some flies are specialized, and we'll get to one of those in a little bit. But among the beetles are beetles like the Buprestrids, the Acmeodera beetles, and you can see the little grains of red pollen from this desert hibiscus right there on this beetle's uh, feet. And you'll see Acmeoderas at a great many plants. This one here is a mimic of a wasp. When it flies, it actually holds the elytra still closed and it extends its wings out beyond that and it looks like a wasp when it's flying. And here's a little Buprestrid uh, agrilaxia visiting uh, Buvardia, which is a plant that we have in our canyons around here that's related to coffee. And here's a nice trichodes. This is a clarid beetle with a lot of uh, pollen on it. And you can see that these, these beetles actually just get covered with pollen. Their fuzzy little bodies are pretty good at that. And among other beetles that you frequently see that might be performing pollination duties are soldier beetles, the Cantharidae, 
and longhorned beetles, some of the day flying longhorned beetles like this one, and scarabeid beetles like this one. Among the flies, the bombaleid flies are interesting because they have evolved convergent evolution, very similar to hummingbird being able to hover and get the nectar with these long structures that they can reach into flowers. And some of the bombaleid flies are quite tiny. This one was photographed on a wild clammy weed, which is a, a wild clammy. And these are only a, a few millimeters in size, but quite spectacular. The surfid flies are called hover flies. And that's a, a well-deserved name, as you can see from this one that's hovering in front of a valerian flower up on Mount Lemon. And they can actually stand still in midair as they hover. You'll see that this is also appearing to look like a hornet. And this is called Batesian mimicry, where a harmless animal mimics a stinging animal. And the surfid flies have a whole array of, of uh, Batesian mimicry. This is another surfid fly, which is mimicking a, humming, uh, a honeybee, actually. And then this surfid fly looks like another hornet or a wasp. Now, not all flies are generalist pollinators. There's this very special fly that pollinates our pipe vine plant. So the, the flower of the pipe vine is a peculiar shape. It has this odd trumpet shape. And then the, the business end of the flower down here is where the male and female parts of the flower are located, is in this pouch. So Aristolochia watsoni, when it's a fresh flower, it has these little hairs. And the whole idea is that this thing looks more or less like the ear of like a rabbit. And the little flies that are attracted to this are actually little biting flies that take blood meals from things like ears of rabbits. So the whole idea is that a little fly is gonna land on that, that flower and be attracted and, and the little downward pointing hairs will make it so that it can't come back out very easily. It's directed down into the pouch of the flower. And there, hopefully, it'll stumble around and pollinate the flower if it had come from a previous Aristolochia flower and possibly was carrying pollen. So once it pollinates the flower down in there, then the male parts of the flower inside that pouch mature and release pollen which will hopefully cover the little fly with the pollen. At that point, the hairs all wither. You'll notice that all the little hairs have withered and that allows the fly to escape out of this passage. And hopefully it'll go and visit another Aristolochia flower and pollinate it. So the beneficiary of this is a third party. It's the caterpillar that is specialized for feeding on these very toxic Aristolochia leaves. So there's just one kind of caterpillar that really is uh, evolved for being able to feed on these leaves. And it munches these leaves very happily. And eventually when it pupates and matures, it's the beautiful pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. So without the horrible little biting flies, which we all dread during the summer monsoons, we would not have these beautiful uh, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars because you really have to have the biting fly in order to produce the food plant for the larva of these butterflies. Now butterflies and moths are considered among the the uh, pollinators out there. So that would include things like the swallowtail butterflies and sphinx moths, although this particular sphinx moth was probably not performing pollination duties when it was getting a nectar reward. As opposed to this sphinx moth, this is a clear winged sphinx moth. And you can see its little face is all covered with pollen as it's reaching in and getting a nectar reward from this wild honeysuckle. A specialized case of pollination between moths and plants occurs in yuccas. So here's a yucca elata, another view of yucca elata. They're beautiful plants when they bloom. And here's a view of the 
flower of the yucca elada. And if you were to look at these flowers at night, you might get lucky and see the little moth that pollinates these plants. So each species of yucca has its own species of yucca moth that pollinates it. And these moths are very unusual in the, in the fact that they deliberately pollinate the plant. Now, most pollination occurs incidentally to an insect or other animal trying to get some kind of product from the plant that, that may be nectar or pollen, and it just incidentally pollinates it. Not so with these little yucca moths. These moths have specialized mouth parts, and they deliberately transfer pollen to the stigma, the end of the, the uh, yucca flower. They'll place the pollen right here so that it pollinates the yucca. And then they lay some eggs in the ovary of the yucca. Now, their larvae feed on the developing yucca seeds. If a moth gets too greedy and lays too many eggs in there, the yucca plant will abort that fruit and those little larval moths will die. The yucca depends completely on this moth for its pollination and the moth depends completely on the yucca as food for its larva. So this is a case of obligate mutualism. And it's a very unusual thing to have that type of a obligate mutualism out in the world of plants and insects. But in the case of yuccas, each yucca has its own species of moth that must pollinate it. Now, wasps are also very good pollinators. The hemipterans are all a, a very important group for pollination. This uh, paper wasp, this polistes, is tanking up on seep willow nectar in the late summer or early fall, and it'll store the fat as calories so they can overwinter, and it'll be one of the founding um, wasps for a colony the next spring. And of course, there's beautiful little wasps like cuckoo wasps. This one is visiting uh, Euphorbia pediculifera. These are frequently just stunning little wasps. They're so brightly metallic, uh, very colorful little animals. And then you have specialized wasps like sawfly wasps. This one here was seen on Phacelia distans. And uh, some of the sawfly larvae are actually leaf miners or uh, herbivores on plants. So in addition to feeding on the pollen and possibly providing pollinative services, their larvae are herbivores. And then you have some special little wasps. This is a flower of the Huachuca water umble, which is a, an endangered plant. These flowers are only about three millimeters in diameter. And what seems to be attracted to them are these tiny, tiny little wasps. And I believe that these might be the pollinators for the Huachuca water umble. That's just a closer view of these tiny little wasps. Bear in mind that flower is only about three millimeters in diameter. Then there are specialized wasps. These are called pollen wasps. And you can see the antenna of this wasp is clubbed. And these will hover and collect pollen. And they then provision these mud nests with the pollen for their larva. So these have undergone convergent evolution, similar to bees, in that this wasp no longer uses insects as food for its larva. It now uses pollen as a source of uh, protein. And of course, bees are among our most specialized pollinators and most efficient as well. Uh, we have about a thousand species of native bees in southern Arizona. So we're one of the bee diversity hotspots of the entire world, actually. And these bees are, some of them are very colorful and very beautiful. Some are more or less generalists. Uh, these centrist bees seem to go for quite a few different species of flowers, as do some of the little sweat bees. And here's another little sweat bee that's visiting a seep willow. These are beautiful little metallic bees. But some bees are specialists. For example, this Trichusa lariae is associated solely with creosote flowers. And this Andrena prima is associated solely with bladder pod mustards. 
Centris pallida is, is usually seen on Palo Verde trees. And Pipanapis are gourd bees. They go only to gourds. You can see all this pollen on the leg of this little gourd bee. And here's one exiting a finger leaf gourd flower. You'll see these bees visiting these flowers uh, early in the morning. And then we have the smallest bee in the world, Perdida minima. And this is visiting a uh, Euphorbia pediculifera flower. These are tiny little plants that um, grow flat to the ground. They're very common and these bees fly in August. So right now would be a good time to look for these bees. And some bees like the megachyle bees are very uh, interesting. They do collect pollen as you can see from they have specialized hairs on the underside of their abdomen for collecting the pollen. But in addition to that, they cut leaves that they use to line the, uh, their nests. So they use nest holes that are frequently things like uh, vacated wood borer beetle holes. And they'll line those holes with these leaves that they cut and Steve Buckman likes to call these bee baby blankets. And they'll fly off with the leaf and use it for lining their uh, brood chambers. And a few of the megachyl bees use flower petals instead of leaves. So this particular species uses a mallow flower petal to line it, the uh, brood chambers. Now a specialized kind of bee is the cactus bee. So diadesias nest in the ground, they're solitary bees, they nest in the ground, but they form these little villages where a lot of solitary nests are close together. And they build these little mud uh, entryways to their burrow. So you can see this little mud entryway. This one happens to be a digger bee, I mean a cactus bee that builds horizontal mud entryways, but some of them built vertical ones. So it looks like a bunch of little chimneys sticking up. Now, what they visit are Opuntia flowers, which include choyas and prickly pears. And you'll notice that this flower looks different from this flower. This one, all the anthers are tied into the center. And this one, they're more sort of straggly looking. So what these flowers do is when they haven't been visited in a long time, the anthers spread out like this. And then when a bee visits, the anthers visibly, they'll move, you can watch them move. They'll close down to the center of the flower. So here's a bee visiting a choya flower, and you'll see these anthers are spread out a little bit, but after it left, all the anthers are tight in. So what these anthers are doing is that they literally hug the bee. The bee starts moving around in there, and the anthers all close in over it and sort of embrace the bee. And these bees are fuzzy, so it gets pollen all over the bee. And that way the bee is more likely to pollinate the next cactus flower. So those diadesia bees, as I mentioned, nest in the ground. And one of the things that happens is that several other species utilize that resource, including these little velvet wasps. This is called a velvet wasp it's, it's, or a velvet ant. They're actually the female wasps that lack the wings and they walk around on the ground looking for diadesia bee nests in the ground. And when they find one, they go down in there and they lay an egg in there and their little larva will usurp that nest. And another species that utilizes the diadesia nest is this bombalia fly. And you'll see these flies hovering over the diadesia nest and they'll flick their eggs into the diadesia burrow entrance and their larva will usurp that nest and use the, uh, the pollen and other resources in that nest for its own development. And here's one more. You'll notice that there's an odd little thing on the leg of this, this bee. This, this little uh, bee has an odd little orange structure here, that's a closer view. That's a beetle larva, it's called a triangulin. And this beetle larva will hitch a ride on that bee leg and it will disembark in the burrow of the diadesia bee. It will usurp that nest and what emerges in the spring is a blister beetle, one of these outrageously 
uh, gorgeous looking blister beetles um, that use bee nests. So one of the morals of the story is, is that diversity begets diversity. A single species diadasia bee can support several other species of organisms that utilize the diadasia as a resource. Now, this would be a good time to talk about uh, the difference between visitation and pollination. So this is a spring coral root orchid blooming up on Mount Lemon. And orchids have a different system of, of storing pollen. The pollen isn't on anthers. Instead, it's on these little maroon packets called pollinia. You can see these little packets right here. So it usually takes a specialized pollinator to transfer those little pollinia from one orchid to another. And nobody knows what the pollinator is on the spring coral root orchid. So I watched these flowers for hours and hours. And I did see many times these little sweat bees going into the flowers. But when they came out, there were no pollinia on their thorax. So they were only visiting, they were not pollinating. So there's a big difference between pollination and visitation. Now, in contrast, while I was up there on Mount Lemon, I also photographed animals that were nectaring on wild strawberry flowers. And I happened to photograph this little surfeit fly and it has some odd maroon blobs on its thorax right there. And in side view, lo and behold, it's obviously the pollinia of a coral root orchid, a spring coral root. There is nothing else that has maroon blobs like that. So this little surfeit fly might be the pollinator for the spring coral root orchid, but we'd have to make more observations to confirm that. So a proper pollinator goes in through the front door of a penstemon. So this is a nice anthophora bee going in and performing its pollination duties through the front door but you can have cheating taking place. So this carpenter bee, this xylocopa, is robbing the flower of its nectar by cutting a slit at the base of the corolla and stealing the nectar and not performing pollination duties. However, plants can cheat too. For example, this comalina flower actually has three kinds of anthers. These bright yellow ones are basically fake anthers those are there to draw in a pollinator. Then there's a central yellow anther. That's low quality fodder pollen. That's as a reward for some pollinator coming in. The real business end are these little inconspicuous anthers down here. So the comalina is sort of more or less cheating its visitors, hopefully getting pollinated, but rewarding them with this lower quality fodder pollen. The biggest cheat out there though is the Calypso orchid. Now these grow up on the San Francisco Peaks area near Flagstaff. And you'll notice that this Calypso orchid has what appears to be anthers, but I already mentioned that, that orchids store their pollen in those specialized little packets called pollinia. So these are not anthers, these are fake. These are really evolved to draw in naive bees. And these naive bees will visit only very few flowers because what they discover is that they get cheated. They don't get any reward whatsoever when they visit these Calypso orchids. So they end up uh, visiting only a few flowers before they learn not to go there anymore. And hopefully they'll have performed some sort of pollination in the meantime. But, but this is sort of a, a strategy of diminishing returns over time. Now we'll talk a little bit about ant-plant relationships. So ants provide protection against herbivores and they also protect herbivores. They do fungus farming, aeration and enhancement of soil and dispersal of seeds. So many plants bribe ants. Ants are kind of the mafia of the insect world. And you can see that this is a barrel cactus bud here. And right next to the bud are these extra floral nectaries. And what the plant is doing is it's bribing these ants to hang around on the plant and hopefully they will defend the, the flower when it opens against herbivores chewing up that flower. 
that the problem with ants is that they can be bought off by anyone who gives them a, an even better reward. So in the case of aphids, aphids, as I mentioned, imbibe way more carbohydrate than what they need, and they release it as sugary honeydew. And ants protect the aphids in return for these sugary treats. So here's an aphid drinking down a drop of honeydew that it just received from one of these aphids. And this takes place underground as well as above ground. So here's some laziest ants that are tending root aphids underground. And they actually protect these little root aphids in return for getting sugary treat re rewards. Another group of insects that bribes ants are the lichenid butterfly caterpillars. So there's a whole group of lichenid butterflies and almost all of their caterpillars have relationships with ants. And these caterpillars will actually provide the ant with a little sugary treat in, in um, payment for defending the caterpillar against predators. And allegedly these caterpillars can actually squeak for help when they are in need of protection from the ants. So another group of ants that has a close relationship with plants are the fungus farming ants. So this is a brand new queen of an acromyrmix ant, which is a leaf cutter ant. And she's digging a burrow right now. So this happened just a few mornings ago after the very heavy rains that we had. These alate queens, this one still has her wings, but she was digging out a burrow. Here's one that has all dropped her wings already after mating, and she's digging out her burrow. Then they seal themselves in the burrow, and they carry a little culture of fungus with them when they disperse from the natal nest. They carry the, the fungus in a little uh, pouch in their mouth. They have a little buccal cavity where they can carry a fungus culture. And underground, what they do is produce uh, more of the fungus, they initially fertilize it and grow the fungus on some trophic eggs that they lay. And then they also lay eggs that produce daughters and the daughters will become workers that go and cut leaves. And what they'll do is gather leaves and flowers and make a sort of paper mache out of this plant material. And they'll grow the fungus on the plant material and they feed on the fungus. The workers, also produce trophic eggs that they feed to the queen ant. And she produces eggs that, that um, make more workers. So there's this specialized cycle between the fungus and the ants, the ants farming the fungus, feeding on the fungus, then the worker ants that fed on the fungus produce trophic eggs, which they feed to the queen, and the queen produces more workers. And the fungus species is so closely um, evolved with these ants that really it's not even found out in the wild anymore. It's, it's basically only in these uh, fungus farms of the ants. And here they are with a bunch of ocotillo flowers around the net the uh, nest entrance, they dry out the flowers a tiny bit before they carry them below ground because they have to be just the right consistency to do the paper mache. Harvester ants are also commonly seen gathering plant materials. And in their case, they frequently gather seeds of grasses, they aer aerate the soil and they deposit a lot of organic material in underground where it doesn't get uh, oxidized. And one of the beneficiaries of harvester ants is our horned lizard, which feeds almost exclusively on Pogonomyrmix ants, which are the harvester ants. There's another trophic level in addition to that that cycles between the horned lizard and the harvester ants. And that's a specialized tapeworm, a species of tapeworm that lives exclusively, a life cycle that cycles between this horned lizard and harvester ants. Okay, and then finally, seed dispersal is our last topic. So the Tura flowers look like this. The Tura reitii is a beautiful white trumpet flower. Some people call these angel, angel trumpets. This is the Tura discolor with the purple flashes in the throat. 
And this is a seed pod of the, the Tura discolor. Now you'll notice that the seed pod sort of aims downward. And if you were to open a ripe one, in this case, I'm lying it on the ground and I've got it upside down. But normally the seeds would be released out of the bottom of the pod from these openings. And if you look very closely at these seeds, you'll notice something really peculiar. There's a kind of a, what looks like a styrofoam cushion at the in between the seed and the maternal tissue of the pod. See each of these little poofy cushions? Here's a closer view of these little white cushions. And these cushions are very loosely attached to the seed. You can actually pull them free of the seed. These are food bodies that are attached to the seed and ants actually get very excited over these food bodies. When they encounter these datura seeds, they'll grab a hold of them and carry them off to the nest. And in the nest, they strip off that food body, they'll eat the food body, and then they carry the stripped seed out to the waste area outside of the nest. The seed is still viable. Removing the food body doesn't do any harm to the seed. And what this does is it, it removes the seed from under the plant and disperses the seeds. Not only does it disperse the seed, but it protects the seed against predation from rodents eating the seed. Uh, if the seed is left under the datura plant, in one study, the seeds that were under the plant were eaten by rodents within three days on average. 100% of the seeds were gone within three days. Uh, if the seeds are carried off to the ant nest where it's more exposed, the rodents really don't like to forage out in an exposed area like that. And this gave the seeds a good month of viability. And in that month, of course, they could be washed away by rain or dispersed in other ways. So this is a method where the plant has evolved and a little reward for the ant for dispersing the seeds and uh, protecting the seeds against rodent predation. So here's a little ant carrying off a seed to the burrow. So I'm gonna finish up this talk with a few thoughts about what Darwin was working through when he developed his theory of evolution. So one of his, th Part of his theory of evolution was that evolution occurred very slowly and gradually by very tiny increments. And all of our flowering plants basically have evolved during the Cretaceous and immediately after that. So he was bothered by this explosion of plant diversity over such a, evolutionarily speaking, short period of time. He referred to this as the abominable mystery. And I think that in light of the co-evolution between plants and herbivores and plants and pollinators, it's easy to see how the co-evolution turbocharges the whole process a natural selection and evolution in general. So, Co-evolution kind of speeds up the whole process. And as a consequence, I think that Darwin would be happy to, to uh, acknowledge that sometimes evolution can move along a little faster if two parties are pushing a, the process along together. Okay, and for those of you who are interested in reading up more about uh, what I was talking about, these books, uh, these three books that I listed here are excellent. And then the business about the study that was done between heart, the, um, the uh, Poganomermix ants and the Datura flowers, where the little food body actually was a wonderful uh, adaptation for the plant. You can read about that in a paper that was published back in uh, 1980. So that's the end of the talk. Any questions? I'll be ready. Well, thank you very much, Gillian. Wow. Um, that little bit at the end there saying there's actually more that you can read about, that kind of worries me because I've had quite enough. There was loads in there. I, 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 I can't, can't hear you, Chris. 
Okay, sorry, I was just saying it's 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 stunning um, what you've told us. The the what's going on out there right under our noses, and the thought that with the four uh, um, publications there you've mentioned, there's actually more we can find out. I mean, I've learned so much in that in in, in this hour. I mean, wow, absolutely incredible. So, Gillian, here's a question for you. Um, as a boy, I used to love um, looking at the Guinness Book of Records. Can you hear me, Julian? Can you hear us? No. Nope. Can you hear us? Hey, Julian, can you hear us? Is it? Can you hear us? Just a, just a moment. Okay. Okay. Gordon can hear us. Can, yeah. can you, let me see if I can hear you guys now. Can you hear me, Julie? Check. Okay, now I can. Okay, uh, sorry, oh, great, I wonderful. You. Here we are. All right, well, right. thank you very much for a fantastic talk. Uh, I was- Right, um, I, blown away. Yeah, so much I'm gonna have to watch there. the whole thing over a few times. I think <laughs> it's the thought that all of this, all of this is happening right under our noses. Yeah, that's one amazing thing. But the other is that you listed those four references at the oh end my there. Goodness. That means there's more to know. I mean, oh, well, you've told us more. so much. Oh I my know, goodness! Those references wow. are just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention was community defense. Um, when plants are undergoing uh, attack from herbivores, the volatile chemicals that they release actually are, are uh, detected by neighboring plants and they will ramp up their, their production of tannins or other alkaloids, or, wow. I mean of alkaloids or tannins or whatever chemical defenses that they have. So that the whole community of plants in the area becomes less attractive to the herbivores. Wow. So, so there's so cons conspiracy involved as well, my oh. goodness. Yeah, so there's a, a community defense um, and right. plants eavesdrop you know, they will detect these volatile chemicals. They, I, I, I was blown away by the idea that, that if a caterpillar chews on a plant, the plant can actually identify what is chewing on it through the chemical signature, the saliva of the, of the caterpillar, and it will release the correct volatiles to call in the right predators and parasitoids to go after that caterpillar. It's, so it's kind it's, of astonishing. There's a logic to it, but nevertheless, it's it's utterly astonishing yeah. that something like that could have evolved. But yeah, yeah. wow, yeah, amazing. So, yeah. so one question, Gillian. Um, okay. As a boy, I used to love reading Guinness Book of Records. So just one of those <laughs> things that you do: largest, fastest, all that type of thing. Now, I feel we're very lucky here in our yard in Hereford. We have the smallest owl in the world. But you've uh -huh. now just told me we might have the smallest bee in the world. Yeah. So where, where would I look for this bee if I wanted to see it, apart from having a magnifying glass? <laughs> okay. Um, well, you'd look for the a plant that's called Euphorbia pedicillifera. It's a very, very common little euphorbia. It lies very flat to the ground and has what looks like tiny white flowers on it. Mm -hmm. the, what look like the tiny white flowers are actually the white part is little bracts because it's it's in the same family as poinsettias and and of course as you know the poinsettia what you see the colorful part are bracts yeah. so um so look for this plant that literally hugs flat to the ground it has little grayish green leaves and these little white what look like little white flowers all over it and if you get down on your hands and knees you might get lucky and see the little uh tiny perdita minima which are literally the size of gnats, okay? And they're fast flying, they're the size of gnats, but if you look very carefully, you will see that they're little, kind of uh, golden brown, little tiny bees with silver eyes. The males have silver eyes. Wow, so, that's amazing. Well, Mary, if you see me crawling around outside this afternoon, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, again? <laughs> and one, one resource that I um, neglected to mention, because for insects, there's many, 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 many resources to learn about insects, but there's an excellent book called The Bees in Your Backyard by, um, by Joseph Wilson, and, and I, I forget the name of his co-author, but it's published by Princeton University Press. It came out only a few years ago, 
and it is by far the best book on looking at North American bees of anywhere, of I any book. Um, yeah, it's a fabulous book. Yeah, we have a copy yeah. here. I definitely I recommend it. Yeah, mm. it's, a, it's a very good one. Published by Pinkston? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Good. So for those good. that are interested in the bees, and, and bees are really really fascinating there's many 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 species i i showed just a very tiny selection of them mm. as kind of a sample we've but, got a question here actually from uh, from daniel asking how many species of bumblebees are there in southern arizona Ooh, bumblebees i cannot tell you off the top of my head how many species um i I'm think guessing. we've only got sonoran in our yard but uh, in southern yeah, arizona Anti and a number of others. Um, I'm guessing probably maybe 10 species, but that's just the guess off the top of my head. You'd have to actually check. Uh, in the bees in your backyard, it, it does show maps with relative um, amounts of different species and you know where they're more abundant with maps of the United States. So you can sort of see where what are the best areas for looking for species of species diversity and numbers. Great. Yes. And everybody is curious about what is your camera set up? Okay. Yeah. So I use a Canon body. Um, I'm on my third Canon body over the space of about 15 years. So about every five years, I literally wear one out. <laughs> um, and I use uh, three different macro lenses. One is a 100 millimeter sort of all purpose macro lens. One is a compact macro lens. <coughs> and one is the MPE 65 millimeter macro lens, which only Canon makes, but some other companies are starting to come out with something that's pretty close to that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but if you're really into the macro photography, having a Canon camera is, is sort of almost a prerequisite because of that MPE 65 millimeter lens. It's a, it's a very, very nice lens for small stuff. Wow. We're getting really great feedback from our um, attendees and saying thank you for an incredible presentation. A fantastic lecture. Didn't know there were so many different types of bees. And uh, what insects are out in great numbers today that we should be looking for in Southeast Arizona? Uh, okay. During the um, you mentioned mm -hmm. the little mini bee. Chrys yeah, the, the Perdita minima flies right about at this time of the year. So that would be a good one. Um, there are a few other bees that I have seen out and about. But um, to be honest with you, there's so many flowers in bloom right now that the spotting the native bees are kind of diluted out by the vast, vast numbers of native flowers in bloom right now. So it takes mm -hmm. a little effort to see the native bees right now. Um, but other things that you'll see at this time of year, some of the herbivores, the chrysomelid beetles, you should start seeing some of those on convolvulucid leaves or on solanaceous leaves. Um, things like the daturas or the nightshades, you mm -hmm. should be able to see some of the bees the herbivorous beetles start working on those. Mm. Okay. So, and then there's always little parasitoid wasps and surfid flies and other things. I love surfid flies. They're just yeah, some they're, of my they're favorite. They're wonderful, <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I love watching them munching down on aphids. The, the larva, when they munch down on aphids, it's really fun because they literally like flurp them down. <laughs> I like how you said that. I <laughs> and, and I love those little bee flies, the ones which have the incredibly long proboscis, yeah. almost longer than the whole yeah. of the body. Yeah, um, the, yeah the really bombelias. amazing. Yeah, yeah the bombelias right. are really great. We're, um, we're going to nice. experiment with our um, electric toothbrush on. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> so that I find yeah, yeah. And, and the tomato plug does that. It happens very quickly. You'll just see that suddenly this little poof of, of pollen shooting out of that anther. Oh, um, gosh. kind of fun. Unbelievable. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, More amazing photography. Thank you for a great presentation. Really Learned great so question. much. Thank you for this amazing presentation. And people are just very blown away. By yeah, it, so. I mean, I had no idea. For example, <laughs> Arizona is like a bee hot spot in the world. I mean, yeah, I knew it was in this country, species but of bees. in the world, that's yeah. that's quite yeah. something. Again, it's the Guinness Book of Record thing. Wow. Oddly enough, that. it's in arid areas that are the real hot spots in the world. I think um, 
Africa. South Africa and possibly somewhere around Israel yeah. um, are also hot spots. And these are all sort of semi-arid uh, places. And, and one of the thoughts is that um, these, a lot of bees nest in the ground and, and really wet areas, there could be mold issues with, with the pollen stores. So oh, it seems to be oh. arid areas that are more conducive to the uh, great bee diversity. We have probably more, we, we do have more diversity than say Costa Rica or, you know, the Amazon when it comes to, to native bees. Mm -hmm. so, so we're really in a wonderful spot, biologically speaking. Interesting. And, and we have another trophic level of bees. Um, don't forget that there's such things as cuckoo bees yeah. which uh, usurp the nests of other bees. So they're true bees, but they don't gather any pollen of their own. They actually usurp another species of bees nest. And we have quite a few different species of cuckoo bees. I didn't go into that, but um, in the talk, but they're really cool. Interesting, very interesting. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Gordon and Lori Lamb. What are the flies that are out in numbers right now? Oh, some of those, okay, some of the little biting noceums are the ones that do that pollination of the Aristolochia watsoni plant. The ones that are the little biting ones that go for the ears. Yeah, that's, that's some of the, when you see this little cloud of these little noceums and they're going for your ears and your forehead, um, those are the same kind as the ones that that do the pollination of the Aristolochia watsoni. Um, but there's there's many little flies out right now. Moisture seems to really draw the flies. So, I mean, uh, not draw them, but be conducive to their emergence and their, the, the, their active part of their life cycle. You know, a lot of insects spend a pretty good chunk of their time in more or less in uh, suspended limbo as they're pupating. You know, so so you'll see them actively out there only for a short period of time, and then they have to sort of wait until it's time to come out the next year. And in the meantime, they, they spend a lot of time pupating, the, the larval ones do. Mm. So. so many emerging now, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Jean. Uh, we're having a gypsy moth invasion in Western New York, defoliating whole groves of oaks. Do the oak trees try to defend themselves? Yeah, the oak trees, um, of course, tannins are their primary defense against herbivory. Um, and new leaves coming out, though, tend to be tender and lower in tannin. And so the, the moth, moth caterpillars can feed on that. Um, there's been various attempts to control gypsy moths with biocontrol, but unfortunately, I think one of the biocontrol agents ended up going after native moths as well. So, you know, you have to be really careful with these um, releasing biocontrol organisms that, that, they, that they stay focused on the, hopefully the target species and don't switch over to a different species. Um, mm. So I don't know what, to, what they'll do about the gypsy moths at this point. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, yes, thanks again for a fabulous talk. Um, thank you for all attending. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Yes. If any of you missed the start of Dillian's talk, we have recorded it and we'll be putting a recording up which will be available through the Southwest Wings website. Mm -hmm. It'll actually be up on our YouTube channel and you can find the link on the, the website and that should be up in a day or so. Yes, thank you so much, Jillian. Yeah. And thank you for having me again. <laughs> so people Always were a pleasure. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, we hope to see you in person next year. Yeah. Okay, At yeah. The festival. Oh. yeah. Hopefully things will be better then. Okay, yes. so you folks take care then. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Jillian. Well, for those of you remaining, we just want to make a couple announcements here. Um, tomorrow, okay, go ahead. Yeah, friend, a reminder that uh, tomorrow we have two more talks. We have one at 11 a.m. Uh, Glenn Maynooth will be talking to us about volcanoes, which is going to be fascinating because I didn't know we had them here in Cochise County. So he'll tell us all about that. Mm -hmm. 
And then in the afternoon, we have Rick Wright coming to talk to, uh, to us about putting together the best um, bird library uh, for birding in Arizona. Um, I'm going to see whether there's some books I can add to my shelves. Maybe. More? Well, maybe. I thought you two. have them all. One or two, maybe. <laughs> okay, great. And finally, yeah, Swarovski Optics, don't forget, please, are uh, down at San Pedro House, down by the river on Highway 90, um, out of Sierra Vista, go towards the river. Yep. On the right down there is San Pedro House. They are there from 9.30 to 4.30. They'll be there until Saturday. Yeah. Um, and there'll also be a representative from um, Jay's Bird Barn who will be able to supply some optical equipment as well if you're feeling like purchasing something. So go and pay them a visit. It's well worth it. And you can do a bit of birding and walk along the river while you're there. Again, thank you everybody for joining us today. And so uh, that's about it for today. And we're going to say goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye, goodbye from, from us. us. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.